Good morning. This is the Blaine's World podcast that can be found each week on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. You can also listen in on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And you can get more information about the show and past shows at our website, www.blainesworld.net. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield. I'm here in my lovely Zoom studio in downtown Fairview, North Carolina. Each week, we focus on uh, news and information about people and organizations in both Western North Carolina and throughout the nation. And toward that end, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Joseph, I love this, a.k.a. Gramps Jeffrey, a children's book author. And Mark, you can feel free to wave to all your fans and friends who are watching this. So, hey, thanks for inviting me. Okay, well, thanks for having me. And that's Mark Joseph. And I love this, Gramps Jeffrey, and we'll talk about that name in a little bit, is a t- pen name for Mark Joseph, whose first book, The Secrets of Retailing, How to Beat Walmart, was written to help entrepreneurs and small businesses compete against big guys. He's also written over 100 articles about small business education, the homeless, several other nonprofit topics. Gramps is currently the co-founder of the new site, www.babyboomer.org, which pulls together news and resources for the baby boomer community. His children's book, I Don't Want to Turn Three, and you can hold it up just so we can see it, and we'll be talking about it. This is his children's book of the cover. I don't want to turn three. Explores what goes through a toddler's mind that parents are so desperate <laughs> to understand. Is based on two experiences he has experienced with his six grandchildren. My only regret, Mark, is I didn't have this book, you know, a whole bunch of years ago. I could have used it. But let's talk a little bit about Mark um, Joseph. And um, in terms of your background, uh, as a kid, did you always grow up as a writer, or what, what got you into writing? No, what I grew up as a normal kid. <laughs> I, I, was, I was lucky enough to have my family live around me. My grandmother lived a couple blocks away. My uncle lived up the street. And uh, I just grew up as a normal kid. I really didn't start writing uh, until mid year way through my life. Um, one, one thing I did do when I was a junior in college, my best friend and I backpacked through Europe for 11 weeks. And I decided to keep a journal. And so every day I'll be writing down who we met, what we met, and and so forth, and all the adventures we had. You know, I made a copy of the journal. I gave it to my friend. And about 10 years later, he says, you know, I just read our journal again. He says, you should publish this. This is this is something interesting. But, you know, I was on to my career. Uh, early on in my career, I was in corporate America with uh, uh, the retailers and wholesalers, major chain stores, and so forth, before I became an entrepreneur myself. Um, and so... I gave up all that writing. Then I decided to become an entrepreneur, and uh, I opened up. Uh, I've opened up three. I've started three different businesses. Uh, one of them I took public, and the company that I took public is a company that was an internet business that uh, supplied to small businesses all around the world. We shipped in all 50 states around 40 foreign countries. Our customer base were the moms and the pops who survive and thrive against the chains. So. Me the way through I was uh, building this company, I was getting these phone calls on how do you open a business? So my first book, which is uh, The Secrets of Retailing, How to Beat Walmart, is a 15-chapter book on how to actually you know, open a business, run it, and then uh, the, the 15th chapter is you know, how do you sell it? What do you, how do you get rid of it? Uh, so that was really my first chance of really writing was when I opened, did my when, first book. When did you write that book? wrote that book about... Uh, 15 years ago? Okay. Because that was, it was kind of a hot topic at the time, you know, how do business compete with Walmart? And I guess you were trying to give them some ideas as to how you could do it. Yeah, because our customer base, you know, we we were teaching people how to survive and thrive against the chains. So right. they would buy from us uh, in case quantity online, and we'd be able to give them the kind of prices that they compete for the big guys with. So you wrote that book 15 years ago, and then take off from there so you kept writing ever since that book yeah what happened was uh, ariana huffington read my book and she asked me to start contributing to the huffington post so i've written over 100 articles on uh, all kinds of small businesses but uh, my passion really has been a nonprofit. so there's articles on the homeless and education and uh, all kinds of things that affect the uh, nonprofit world also and so then uh, you know what happened is uh, the uh, the good old COVID hit 
And so it changed my life. Yeah, I, I, and uh, I was lucky enough to have all six of my grandkids living with us for about six weeks. So it gave me a chance to kind of see how little kids work, how they really react to each other. And that was the, the, the theme for my book, uh, I Don't Want to Turn Three because one of my grandkids was turning three. Uh, and it's a true story. <laughs> All the pictures in the book are pictures that I've taken. I sent to a uh, artist to go ahead and make them into look like cartoons, but it's a true story. You know, and the theme of the book really is at uh, what age do you begin to take responsibility for your actions? You know, is it three years old? Is it 13 years old? Is it 23 years old? You know, I'm a baby boomer. I got plenty of 63 year olds that still don't take responsibility. I was going to say, how about, how about a soon to be 74 year old? You know, do I have? Yeah, right across the board. <laughs> so, you know, that's really the theme of the book uh, is how do you do that? You know, when does a child understand the difference between me and us? And so that's really the theme of my children's book. But go back a little bit to something you said, Mark. And you mentioned you wrote this book with you wrote this diary when you were in college. Uh, did you ever decide? Are you ever going to publish that, or are you ever going to do anything with it? Um, no, I, I haven't decided to do that yet. I, you know, what happened fifty years ago is a lot different than what's going on well, today. No, I, I love to say, and let's give a shout out. Is the guy still around? You you took the trip with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. and his name is his name is Hank. Hank and last name Goodman. Goodman. So Hank, if you're watching this, or I'll send you a copy of this if you're in touch with him. We talked about it on the Blaine's World podcast tonight. And uh, that'd be kind of fun to recreate that, though, you know, all these years later, you know. Yeah, I don't know if I'm in the same kind of shape to be able to uh, <laughs> ride, uh, you know, all the trains and uh, sleep in uh, youth hostels or a train thing. But but yeah, yeah, it'd be kind of fun. It must have been some experience as a kid to have done that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, back in those days it was safer to i was going to say that i, I can't imagine you know parents even allowing kids to go you know uh, around the world at that point in time so you survived that experience you survived a lot of other experiences corporate america what how did you come up with the name grandpa jeffrey well my name is gramps jeffrey is my pen name and right. it came about because i found early on little kids could say the G's pretty fast. And I, <laughs> I, I wanted to say Gramps before anything else. So so that's where it came from. And my middle name is Jeffrey. And my wife for years has spelled it wrong. So I figured <laughs> that if I put it on a book, she'll <laughs> learn how to spell it. And yes, she does. She spells it right now. So what, what's the correct spelling of it? J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. And how do your wife spell it? J-E-F-F-E-R-Y. <laughs> okay so what did your grandkids call you though are you Gram Gram gramps joseph or gram mark they just or... call me gramps gramps they don't know my other names they just call me gramps okay so the idea of writing this book came during covid which is kind of interesting describe the writing process then so you, you're coming up with an idea and then what got you into the writing of it well you know living in this whole those past years uh, because of the pandemic caused by covid and isolation and except for being able to, to be with my family, you know, gave me my special time to watch and interact with each grandkids. And I got to tell you what a trip that was, because all six of these kids have completely different personalities. You know, the one thing they do have in common is a sense of curiosity and how excited they do get when they accomplish something. You know, watching them grow year to year and how they interact with each other really was, was the basis for this book. But, you know, what goes through a toddler's mind? Uh, the parents are so desperate to understand. When does a toddler really understand, you know, who they are and how, how they be different between me and us, like we were talking about? You know, this book explains how a family kind of figures out together. And I think our family is not too much different than many, many other families around the world. You know, as a baby boomer myself, you know, I'm trying to understand how the world has evolved since I was three years old. You know, that's also part of the story. You know, my, my parents didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the Internet. You know, they didn't have cable TV. They didn't have remotes. I was my dad's remote. He said, son, go check the <laughs> channel. You know, and I would, uh, I'd be the remote of the time. Now, my parents' definition of discipline is quite different than parents uh, of today. Has today's world made for a better place for children to grow up? You know, I'll let your listeners kind of answer that question as you weigh in how you were treated growing up versus how you treat your kids today. Well, Mark, so, I, you know, I wrote, I wrote this book really to read to the grandkids. Let me ask you this in terms of the six grandkids. First of all, I'm wondering, what was the age range of these six grandkids? At the time I wrote the book, it was yeah. one to eight. One to eight. And yeah. they were all in your house at the same time? 
Yeah, we were able to have them all around at the same time for about six weeks. And they were all getting along. They were getting along. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I like, you know, like we were talking about. That I grew up. My family lived in town, but in today's world, our kids don't live next door. You know, I, I've got. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've got one daughter and her two kids who live here. And I've got another daughter and her two kids live in Austin, Texas. And I've got another daughter and her two kids live in Orlando, Florida. So it's a whole different kind of world that we live in today versus what I was growing up. So the communication is a lot different. You know, how do you keep in touch with those that don't live down the street? Um, and so you know, that's also part of the adventure. How do you get them all to your house then for that, the six weeks? It's, uh, you know, everybody lost their jobs or they went remote. And so, they, they, you know, they couldn't get out into the world. So they all came and then they went home. <laughs> Something you said uh, struck a chord with a discussion I had with my wife just the other day. We were wondering, uh, Mark, do people still, like kids, still play outside? When I was a kid, you know, kids would play all outside together and make up games, stuff like that. Do kids still do that? Well, you know, you got to realize that this generation that is coming up today, kids one to 10 years old, are going to be the greatest generation this country has ever seen. Reason being, as soon as they come out of the womb, they're on the internet. You know, they got their <laughs> iPhones. They, got, you know, they are electronically connected. They know a lot more things than I ever did at that age. So it's up to us as grandparents and parents to do exactly what you said. Get them out of the house. Get them out <laughs> You know, we've got to be that influence. That's why it's so important for grandparents to get involved in today's kids, because we've got to be able to offset, you know, what they're just picking up on the Internet and electronically with what we grew up with and the, the knowledge that we can change them. You know, th that's the sad thing in today's world. 30 percent of grandparents just don't want to get involved in the raising of their grandkids. Uh, you know, they, they may show up at a birthday party or, the, but, you know, they, they said, listen, uh, these 30% of us, that means one out of every three of us just don't want to get involved. You know, they're, they're saying to themselves, hey, I raised some great kids. They'll <laughs> raise their grandkids. I got to go play pickleball. You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, you've got to take a look at what is causing us as a generation, a third of us, not to connect to these little kids when they need us more than ever, because we've got to be able to offset all these things that they've learned on the internet. Well, you know, there's all kinds of things that cause us not being involved in the lives of our grandchildren. One of the things that could be is, you know, our kid married a spouse we don't like. OK, so that causes <laughs> problems. You know, we, we that causes all kinds of issues. We may be giving our children unsolicited advice, you know, we, by telling them what to do. That causes strain between parents and grandparents and their kids. By the way, let me let me jump in on that, because that's a fascinating point about the idea of giving advice as a grandparent where do you kind of draw the line between giving advice and not giving advice well you know we've got to step back and think about what causes all of our rift between us and our children you know and undermining their authority uh, by challenging them what they are teaching their children uh, is one of those things you know, grandparents question the parents' values and their family structure. You know, that causes issues for us. You know, tendency for us, you and me, to play favorites and manipulate siblings causes issues in a family uh, that, you know, that, that we don't, that we causes problems. You know, I've got six grandkids. You know, I've got a favorite, but I'm not going to tell you. I, in fact, <laughs> I've never told my wife. Yeah, you know, because you just you got to treat them all equal. Otherwise, that causes problems for us. You know, transactional control of kids. We give them money. We give them gifts. You know, we give them vacations. Parents may not like to be buying into that. That causes problems for us. We as older people and, you know, older, I don't like to view myself as older, but we are, you know, is, uh, you know, we may lack empathy. We may not be able to understand and share what uh, what these little kids need as uh, as they're crucially growing older, you know. And then we may we, we ask these kids to respect us and uh, and to, to 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 demand the attention and so forth. So those are all kinds of things that kind of answer the question of what you said, you know, about giving advice. You know, we kind of step in the way there, and so that's what's causing all thirty percent of us to be not involved in. Uh, in the raising of these kids. How about the other thing you were talking about, about the use of electronics? And, you know, you again lived through this period of six weeks. Um, at what stage 
the electronics take over, you know, the kids' lives. And and did you did you encounter that when you had them? So what's interesting is it is driven by the parents. You know, of of my three daughters that each have two kids, one lets their two kids get on the electronics all the time. Okay, and you know it, it's a way I think for her to be able to they they entertain each other. Um, the other two don't let them get on the electronics at all. You know, they, it's a real special for them to do that uh, because don't forget children reflect what their parents do. So if you're a parent or a grandparent and you're on your phone all the time, there's a good chance your child's going to go down their phone all the time. They, they imitate what you do. If you're as a parent, take them outside to play soccer, they're going to learn to play soccer. So that's the role of parents today is, you know, we've got this responsibility, you know, the, 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 they, they got to teach these kids the right things to do. And at six, you had, how many had their own phones? Uh, and luckily for us, none had their own phone oh. at that point in time. Now, a couple of them do now. They're a couple of years older, but no, then none of them did. Now, there must be very, like you had them how many years ago, two years ago, or how many years ago were they with you? Yeah, a couple of years ago. So that must have been quite an adjustment then now for you, not seeing them all the time. And I guess now you see them much more rarely. Well, what's interesting is, again, as parents and grandparents, you know, as parent grandparents, you know, out of sight is out of mind. Okay. okay. In other words, yeah. You know, again, I've got kids in Orlando, and I've got kids in the, in 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 Austin. They're not picking up the phone and calling me. Yeah, you know, you've got to go reach out and do that. So we had to figure out a way that we could take and keep in touch with these kids when they left us. And so what's interesting is the language of little kids is dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been involved with them, but little kids, two to seven or eight years old, they love dinosaurs. Uh, in fact, what's interesting is when they go out to meet new kids, one of the first subjects they all talk about is dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't know how it comes about. <laughs> a couple of these grandkids that know more about dinosaurs than, than I ever thought of. I mean, all six of my grandkids can tell me the names of these long dinosaurs. <laughs> They can tell me whether they eat meat or they eat vegetables. They can tell me who they fight with. So dinosaurs is a language of little kids that we as adults don't really realize, but it is. Listen to them on the playground. Um, you know, so check and see what kind of toys they have. So what we decided to do as grandparents, knowing that the, 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 the language that they all came together on was about anything to do about dinosaurs. We've, we've got six dinosaurs here in our house that they always played around. So we decided that every night we were going to have these six dinosaurs do something different around the house. So <laughs> one night they were in the refrigerator eating blueberries. <laughs> Another night they were by the uh, sink with grandma washing dishes. You know, another night they had soap on their nose. It really looked like they were washing the dishes. You know, another night they were playing the piano. Another night they were walking up the steps. So we put together 50 different nights of the dinosaurs doing something different around our house or outside our house that the kids could relate to because they were right there in the house with us. So what happened was when the four kids left to, to, to go back to their home, uh, we started getting phone calls from these kids every night. We became part of their routine. <laughs> So they would, uh, you know, they they would uh, take their bath. The mom and dad would read a book, and then they would say, "What are the dinosaurs doing tonight? Let's call Gramps." So they would they would call my wife's uh, iPhone, you know, and uh, we would get on uh, Facebook time, and you know, they said, "Where's Gramps? Where's the Gramps? What are the dinosaurs doing tonight?" So that was our way of communicating and keeping in touch with these kids all around the country. I'm sure your listeners can come up with all kinds of other different ways, but that was our way because, you know, to answer your question is, yeah, out of sight, out of mind, they forget who you are. So you've got to create some kind of connection uh, so that you can become part of their life when they're not living down the street. One of my good friends, uh, Tom Gallagher, who's listening, has a tradition with one of his nieces every Sunday night at seven o'clock. He has a phone date with her. You know, it's just, I think it's beautiful that he doesn't let anything get in the way of that, that they just, you know, it's clocked in. They'll do it on a regular basis. And I guess what I'm hearing you say is you have to give some thought to it because if you don't give some thought to it, it ain't going to happen. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these kids, you know, they, they, they want you in their lives. But again, if you're not there, it, it, they, they've got other priorities to do. But the title of the book, which I love as well, I'm looking at it again, you have it in front of you, I Don't Want to Turn Three. What was the way to get the idea for that title? Well, it was very evident that um, the when you're two years old, everybody is focused on you. <laughs> But when you're starting to turn three, uh, you're not as focused. So <laughs> the, you know, the recap of the book very quickly is Jordan, uh, who is two years old, turning three tomorrow. Um, he's playing with all of his different cousins. And, and when he plays with different cousins, he takes all their toys. You know, Levi, he takes, takes all of the toys that he's got, which are sea creatures. Uh, with uh, Jackson, he takes all his toys, which are dinosaurs, and he does that. With his um, uh, Grace, he takes all of her dolls. And so he accumulates all these different toys from all the different cousins. And then uh, everybody comes over to, to the house for his third birthday party and brings gifts and so forth. And his oldest cousin, who is Olivia, turning eight, who is a great dancer, she just loves to dance, he had taken her dancing shoes. And she goes into his room and says, what are my dancing shoes doing in the Jordan's room? And everybody runs in and says, what's my dinosaurs doing here? What? You know, Jordan had accumulated all these things. And dad calls, the dad calls all the kids together to figure out how to, what to do with all this information. Uh, and Olivia comes up with the idea that her, her class is giving away to the homeless kids downtown all kinds of toys and convinces all her cousins to give everything that, that Jordan has taken to the uh, kids downtown uh, for, the, for the homeless kids. And that's how the book kind of comes together. So it's a book of a family kind of you know, being mad at each other, but coming together to do the right thing. What do the other kids think about the book? Or after it was finished, did you then sit down and read it to them? Or what was the process? Yeah, what's interesting is Grace, who lives in Austin, was just here two weeks ago. And she's now, she was three at the time, she's now four, or she was two and now four. Uh, she she looks at the book, she says, that's our family book. <laughs> and, uh, and then what happened, I saw that uh, Olivia took two of her cousins. She didn't know I was in this, uh, watching them, but she grabbed the book. They ran under my desk for some reason. And she started reading the book to him. I was listening to him outside. And, and Jackson says, that's me. And Levi said, that's me. Yeah, so, so they're really into it. Do the illustrations look like the kids also? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, I mean, it's pretty cool that have a little kid have a book that they're featured in, you know, six six different kids. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Down, down, you know, we're all looking for our legacies. Hopefully, no, this one. Sounds- Incredible. But I'm waiting, Mark. So when do we now see the, the TV show of this? You know, we have the Brady Bunch. <laughs> we, we have the Joseph Bunch, right? Based on, right. Are, are we trying to sell the rights to this? <laughs> no, no. I just want to share. I want yeah. everybody, I want every family to go through what we went through. And hopefully it'll help uh, teach little kids to do better things. Talk if you would, Mark. I'm always interested in speaking with authors about your writing process. Did it take did you write every day for a certain period of time or did you just do it all at once? How long did it take you? It depends on my book. My first book, which was The Secrets of Retailing, How to Be Walmart, you know, which is a 15-chapter book. Um, it took me, what I did was obviously I was working at the time. And, and the reason, the only reason I wrote it is because our customers were asking us different questions of how, what do you do when you, when you do this? How do you find your location? Where do you find your merchandise? How do you hire people? Things like that. So I took nine months weekends only because i was working during the week and i would come home and on a, a friday night and i would say to my wife i'll see you sunday night and i would just sit and write you know every weekend uh for that particular book and so that's the process it took me for that uh because it was, I was, it was very focused because i knew what i wanted to accomplish each chapter i wanted each chapter to be separate and be a teaching moment for for, for entrepreneurs and small business owners uh, my children's book after all the kids left, I just sat down and it took me a day. It was like, you know, they, it was a true story. So it was just, how do you pull it all together? And so you pulled it all together. And then in terms of publishing it, did you publish it or you had a publisher for it? Uh, for my business book, I had a publisher for my children's book because it was going to take so long during the pandemic to get anything published. I went ahead and I published it myself. So if people want to get this book, what's the best bet? 
Uh, just go to Amazon. It's in on Amazon or go walk into a Barnes and Noble. You'll see it in the Barnes and Noble. Uh, those are the best ways to do it. Or come to my site, which is gramsjeffrey.com. Okay, if they go to gramsjeffrey.com, and by the way, spell it Jeffrey, we'll get it again. Yes, G-R-A-M-P-S-J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. One word, right? Right. Okay, so if they go there, is there other stuff they'll find at that site? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I write blogs. There's uh, probably 50 different blogs that they can read about. It all has to do with uh, children and raising kids and things like that. Um, there's the podcast I've been on. Uh, and they take you back to uh, my latest adventure, which is babyboomer.org, which is our site that uh, we have built for the baby boomer generation. And so what, if people go to that site, what are they going to find? Well, you know, you take a look at the site's called babyboomer.org and the baby boomer generation is as diverse as any other generation before or after us whether it's religiously or politically or ideas you know we are just so diverse but the one thing that baby boomers have in common is that the, 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 we have a shared connected experience and this is because when we were growing up, there were only three television stations. We all had <laughs> landlines, you know, so we all got the same information. So when you think about the baby boomer generation, you know, and those are those are people that were born uh, between 1946 and 1964. You know, we 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 had all these things in common. We were there for all the Kennedy assassinations, Martin Luther King's assassination. We were there for the landing on the moon. You know, birth control became widespread during our generation. Vietnam, we were there to the experience of Vietnam and the riots in the street. But what really brought us together was music. I mean, you think about Elvis, the Beach Boys, uh, Three Dog Night Association, Supremes. You know, and the, in fact, there was a special on television last night on the Beach Boys. It was a two hour special. Uh, you know, and I'm sure baby boomers are watching it, but I think everybody is watching that. Uh, you know, we were brought together by all the movies, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, Animal House, Jaws, or any of the Spielberg movies. You know, you know, the, the Godfather, those are all things that brought this generation together. So we decided to create the site that not only talked about what we did in our past and all those great things, but, you know, offer resources for retirement and finance and travel and dealing with the uh, new challenges we're all facing, whether it's technology, you know, not everybody can do a podcast. This is not easy. And <laughs> so it's technology and, and all the uh, uh, all the health issues we're facing, dementia, and Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. So that's what the site's all about. It's a one place where uh, baby boomers or any generation just can do all kinds, gets all kinds of information. Uh, and it's updated every day. We've got uh, over 500 contributors who are writing articles and podcasts. And every day, the new ones come to the front of the site and people can see what the uh, latest information is for our generation. Again, the website is babyboomer.org. And that's just and anybody who fits in that, I guess, does, doesn't have to be that age range, but ideally it's trying to reach these people. 19, what were the years, 1946 to? Yeah, 1946 to 64. But what's yeah. interesting is early on, where we thought it would be for baby boomers, we are getting a lot of traffic from baby boomer children and grandchildren because they're just trying to understand this generation. They're going to try to figure out what makes my, my parents or grandparents tick. And so we're getting a lot of traffic from other generations on the site also. And I'm trying to understand it also. So, you know, I, I can relate. So definitely something to uh, check out. What do you see in terms of um, next writing effort? Do you see a, a follow-up book to this one? Well, I'm working on, uh, I don't want to turn four. Okay. But <laughs> what's interesting What's interesting is my granddaughter, uh, Olivia, who just turned 10, came to me uh, two weeks ago. She says, Gramps, I got a great idea for our next book. And, and I said, what is it? She says, I don't want to turn 10. I said, why don't you want to turn 10? She says, well, you know, I, I got to start worrying about driving. I said, that's 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 six years away. Why are you worried about that? She says, you know, and I got to start thinking about going to college. I don't know where I want to go. That's eight years away. Why are you worried about that? So when you think about it, you know, there's a book for all of us. I don't want to turn 21. I don't want to turn 60. I don't want to turn 70. You know, so the, because because it's all about what we've gone past again and then what's the uh, future look like on you know what where could it be so those are a series of books i'll be working on i, I love it but every, every year you know you do it every single year but you know what you said too i don't want to turn a certain age there's a joke there somewhere i'm, I'm forgetting the, the joke but about you know you get over a certain age it's no longer like you get to be 21 you get to be 
80, you know, 90 or something. Each age has different, I guess, issues that, that come up with that particular age. So oh, I, yeah. think, I, I think you have a winner there and I'll, I'll have to <laughs> dig up the joke, but it's a great concept. So I'll keep busy for the next, you know, couple of years writing all these different books, but you know, it'd be fun to have you write them and, and with the grandchildren, you know, have like a co-author each one. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to do to have them be the co-authors? Yeah, that was Olivia's idea. She says, yeah, "Grant, we're yeah. going to write this book." Oh, so she she wants she wants in on the royalties, right? She wants oh, that's to, exactly right. And, and I'll pay for the college education. You <laughs> yeah, know, you got it. There yeah. you go too. So, anyway, Mark Joseph, I'd like thank you for being my guest on this Millions World podcast. A lot of fun. I always know I have a great guest in that. If I'm laughing, that's a good sign. So you had me laughing throughout the um, podcast. To wrap up again, best way to get in touch with you is what. Well, you can come to uh, my site at gramsjeffrey.com. You can come to our site at babyboomer.org or just email me directly if you have any questions or want to continue the conversation at gramsjeffrey at gmail.com. Okay, well, anyway, certainly ways to get in touch with you. And I look forward to, again, reading the book. I'm guilty I haven't gotten a chance to read the book, but it sounds like a lot of fun. And I guess the last question to ask you in terms of the book, um, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to uh, turn three, uh, who should who should read that book? Well, it should be read in several different ways. One is what's interesting, again, using my granddaughter, Olivia, she's reading it to the younger kids. <laughs> okay, So it's great for a child who knows how to read to read it to the younger kids. Obviously, it's great for parents, but it really is geared for grandparents. I want grandparents to get more involved in the raising of their kids. And if they can use my book or 100 other great children's books, Take the time to read to kids because it's so important for us as, as grandparents to read to kids. I mean, what are the reasons we should do it? Well, one is bonding. You know, it's just a nice way for us to spend time together. You know, sitting on your lap for 10, 15 minutes, it gives you a chance to really bond for those kids. A second thing it does is it supports listening skills. Now, you and I both know at our age that listening skills are the best skills that we have. You know, you as a podcaster have to listen to ask the right questions. I've got to listen to, to sell the right stuff. You know, so listening skills, if we can teach these kids when they're two, three, and four years old how to listen, you know, reading a book requires them to listen. This is a great skill we can teach them. You know, reading books to kids it creates uh, better cognitive and language development. You know, when you think about it, there's plenty of these words in these books these kids don't understand. It gives you a chance to explain them. There's plenty of words I don't understand. I got to go look up. But, you know, it gives you a chance to, to, to really create cognitive and language development. And then the last thing it's good for is attention span. You know, these three-year-olds, they bounce off the wall all day long. <laughs> Get them in your lap for, you know, three, for, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. It helps key concentration and self-discipline, which we all have to learn as we grow older. And if you would, I'll have you just hold the book up one more time, book we're talking about. So I don't want I don't want to turn three by um with the title is is Mark Joseph on or what's the title on the author uh, of the book? Gramps Jeffrey is my pen name for writing the children's book. Okay, so by Gramps Jeffrey, I think you'll have a lot of fun with the book. And again, I'll say uh Gramps or Mark, thanks for being my guest. I look forward to being in touch. You got it. Thank okay, you. Th Bye -bye. Thanks again.